the low city carbon uh, program of Thailand, which is uh, a little bit different, but set a frame for small activities on a community level. So we thought also this concept now could be brought from these early experiences also to Article 6.2, where we can have some experiments uh, to expand the scopes of these activities. You know, uh, the programmatic approaches uh, have uh, focused on uh, community-oriented uh, activities in remote areas, for example, biogas, uh, water uh, purification and, and so on, cook stoves, of course. But uh, we hope uh, that we can expand the scope to more important uh, uh, project types and program times, which supports uh, the NDC ambition of the host country to get uh, during the next decades to a transformational process in important sector. So we are uh, very sure that when we combine our methodological work, uh, the question how it relates to the NDC, we can combine certain revenues from uh, the own resources of a country, from the climate finance, and uh, where it's eligible carbon market. So this is our idea to find out uh, what we can do with this. And uh, at the end, we would like uh, also with these activities today to get back for the, not only for the negotiations, but also into the capacity building activities we have to explore how it finds a way to define what a host country can do with the NDC, with a more programmatic approach uh, up to whatever you can scale up when you have defined uh, your NDC uh, in detail. So I hope we will have a good contribution today to this question. So thank you for coming here. Thank you very much, Thomas, for uh, setting the scene uh, so well. Um, so now I guess everybody's very curious what has come out of the research uh, that has been carried out. And uh, for that, I'm, I have the pleasure to handing over to Stefan Hoch, who's um, uh, Managing Director at uh, Perspectives Climate Group uh, and also a co-author of um, the studies. So, uh, Stefan, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for kicking us off and also Thomas for providing um, the context also and, and Germany's views on the concept of pure ways. Um, I will try to now present uh, to you a, a very, very quick run through a, a, a really a rich and, and dense set of findings. We have a very distinguished panel with us today, so I'll try to keep this fairly short. It may feel a bit rushed, but of course, you'll have ample opportunity to revisit all of our data and insights um, at your convenience uh, in the reports. Next slide, please that you also see on the slide with a QR code um, for your convenience. Um, so there are actually three reports, whereas the, the final one, the report three, is, is more or less like a synthesis that um, if you have a little time, you would be best advised to, to, um, to consult. We did try to have here a mix of, of quantitative, you know, data crunching, what is really the performance of those POAs in, 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 in facts and figures. But we did also provide more of a qualitative analysis and critical reflection on the conceptual elements and how they can be made productive for POAs. So that's why um, we have um, structured this in various reports. And of course, in the second report in particular, we've also had a very comprehensive and globally oriented set of interviews where shareholders, uh, stakeholders directly um, shared their views. And there is a very nice dashboard where you can also, you know, look at the data and play around with it a bit. And, and so I, we'd also invite you to do that as well. Next slide. Um, next slide. So to, to start uh, on sort of the key messages, uh, I think our reports and research verified that POAs did enable rapid upscaling of, of mitigation outcomes by significantly simplifying and accelerating the inclusion procedures, not only in the CDM where the concept originated, but also the concept was diffused into the main voluntary carbon market standards. Um, 
And how this came about was that POAs enable the inclusion of unlimited mitigation activities. So at the beginning of the project, you don't need to define ex ante exactly what you're going to do, but you can build and expand that over time, um, also across multiple countries. Um, so this was a significant improvement, first from the single project and then later on the, the so-called bundling approach. Um, and what, what we saw and what also, for instance, Hari in the Carbon Initiative for Development uh, really took forward was, was to include uh, POAs that are not only multi-country, but that are also supporting multiple technologies, so various types of off-grid electrification technologies, for instance. And the result of that, as you see in the last bullet, was that um, POAs clearly um, made a contribution to improving the access to carbon finance, firstly for small scale technologies, but also for African countries and LDCs. And of course, carbon markets are not only about mitigation, they are also about sustainable development and, and equity normative considerations in the bigger picture of how this instrument is supposed to contribute to global climate policy objectives. So, so this is very, very important because it was, of course, also a, a sticking point and then a criticism of the CDM that the distribution of benefits was not shared equally. So carbon markets therefore significantly benefited from this improved access to um, the CDM by Africa and LDCs that POA is made possible. Next slides. <clears throat> so now we are starting to, to run quickly through some of the numbers. Um, so this is only the CDM. We didn't look at, at voluntary carbon markets, which, which also took up the POA concept, as I mentioned. But in the CDM, um, we saw 359 registered POAs. And now what is really quite interesting is that only 91 of them, like around a quarter, actually resulted in actual CR issuance. Of course, as Thomas has already explained, carbon markets, uh, sort of, sorry, um, POAs came of age during the time when carbon markets prices basically, you know, entered an area of, of continual depression, so to speak. It was a very low price environment for the longest time. And as soon, of course, as um, the carbon prices started to pick up, the, the, the transition from the Kyoto to the Paris area began and the temporary measures and the CDM pre prevented further issuance. We'll also show you some numbers on that. But what is encouraging is that those POAs that did get registered and, and also issue did fulfill their promise of not only having one or two component projects, but an average of almost eight. So we have a total of almost 3000 CPAs, 2800 something to be precise. And, and this is often forgotten when we talk about the aggregated number of CDM activities. We often look at the projects only sometimes then also at the POAs, but it is not always fully recognized that each CPA, each component project activity, part of a POA, is actually fully equivalent to a single uh, project activity in terms of its scale, because the same methodologies and thresholds are being followed there. And again, the issuance fairly low, only in quotation marks, only 55.5 million CERs. Um, and, and this raises some very interesting questions. Firstly, on you know why is that performance relatively low? But then also it raises a similarly uh, relevant question, or maybe even more importantly, of, of can this potential still be mobilized through um, an unlocking of the temporary measures for the pre-2020 vintages, but also the CDM transition potential for the post-2020 vintages. So this shows that there are a lot of questions that are largely unexplored um, related to the POA portfolio that we already have. And of course, keep in mind that new additions uh, to those existing POAs can still be made. Next slide. So this shows you the POA performance per region. As we already mentioned, um, the participation of African host countries in the POA portfolio was significantly higher than the single project portfolio, where we have a share of largely 3% for single projects in Africa now to, to highlight that. Whereas now in the uh, POA portfolio, this was much more successful with a significant share of, of um, more than a third, um, both for the activities, but also then the issuance. And I think um, 
overall, we can also see that the POAs with issuance actually concentrate in Africa. And this is a very important finding. Next slide. This breaks down the POAs in numbers now by technology. So what you can clearly see from this picture, we, we will not go, now go through each individual technology, but we can really see that some technologies were very strongly supported by the POA concepts, others not so much. Of course, what we largely see is that the small or PICO scale technologies, you know, like household levels, um, stoves, uh, solar electrification, water purification. These are typically known to be supported by POAs, but we also see some where, for instance, here in the hybrid, hybrid renewables category, um, these are also large scale projects um, that also benefit from the POA approach. So we can clearly say um, small scale technologies were brought into the CDM for through the POA concept but also the larger scale technologies, at least potentially, um, were able to benefit from this simplified approach to upscaling um, in, through their programmatic approach. And under the energy efficiency households label, which is by far the most effective one in terms of issuance, it's important to recognize that yes, these are the stoves uh, that, that are best known, but it is also electrification and water purification. So it actually aggregates um, various technologies under this category. Next slide. So again here, similar message, but now also underpinned with data, how specific technologies performed between the POA and the single project approach. So the message is very clear. Um, POAs really helped unlock access to the CDM um, through the programmatic framework. So I think that's a very clear message. Um, on the other hand, we of course also see certain technologies now in the transport space, geothermal and industrial gas, where it was um, more successful under the single project approach. But today we are concentrating on POAs. So next slide. Um, now taking the next step from reflecting on the actual data that, that we see in the existing quantitative portfolio, thinking about how does that fit into Article 6. And it's very clear in the Article 6 rules that programs as well as projects are part of the approaches that are eligible to participate in Article 6. But of course, it's important to think a little bit more deeply about which lessons can be learned from the experience under the Kyoto era, um, how, how that can be made productive for the Paris Agreement mechanisms. And what we see here so far is that 64% of all regions have developed already Article 6 pilots. These are largely small scale, which are typical for POAs. Only 50% of those include a sectoral scope and 85% of them are implemented in single countries, as opposed to the multi-country approach that we already know from the CDM um, under the POA approach. And how these projects dealt with complexities in registration and implementation, um, I think we can see that most of those projects uh, are not following more innovative approaches, but are more or less following the procedures that we know from single projects. Most of these countries have a centralized project managing entity, um, but POA projects in African countries in particular subscribe to a centralized management entity that oversees the implementation of projects. So we have defined a few characteristics here in the research, but the key message is that POAs already have a lot to offer in terms of experience and also regulatory provisions with managing complex multi-stakeholder, multi-country, multi-technology implementation arrangements. It is quite understandable that in the early stage now of Article 6 implementation, um, the, there's more experimentation at a smaller scale that would assume, we assume will be expanded over time. We'll be interested to hear from World Bank Click and others what the, what the vision here is. Um, but I think, um, yeah, the POA concepts really have a lot to offer for, for, for also Article 6 implementation. Next slide. Next slide. Good. So getting to these key experiences, and this is now the observations that stakeholders that we interviewed um, shared with us. 
So there is a clear confirmation and, and recognition that the POA framework increased access, in particular for low-income countries, for more decentralized mitigation activities, so not single power plants or waste management sites, but, but you know, household level and smaller scale uh, activities. There is a very strong approval of the POA concept when it comes to time and cost savings. So, so this uh, intention of POAs to overcome some of those barriers and transaction costs compared to standalone projects is clearly recognized, even though there are these questions around issuance, success, and so on. Um, but there is also a cautionary um, element in there that you know the long period of time to register a POA and develop it is still quite burdensome. So getting a POA registered is takes a lot of effort, but once the POA is registered, then scaling that up by including new component activities, that is where the benefits can really be reaped. And I think this is also a very strong factor when it comes to thinking about um, what's the relevance of transitioning those existing POAs that are fully registered under the CDM where all that effort has gone in, how can we make that productive and you know harness the synergy and efficiency and potential? Um, of, of, of utilizing those uh, POAs in which all of these investments have already been made. Of course, in terms of performance, there is a question around institutional capacities of DNAs. This refers now, of course, to the Kyoto area CDM DNAs, and, and that may not always be fully concurrent with the Article 6 DNAs. That is still a fastly evolving picture. Um, but I also think that the data clearly shows us, or the stakeholder responses, I should say, is that the performance of, of POAs um, in a way bottom up can significantly influence the engagement of countries. Um, yeah, even though the overall CR assurance still remains low. Next slide. Moving forward now towards the Article 6 framework, um, the advantages in the transition of POAs that already referenced several times um, is in our view clearly advantages um, and it was also the priority of, of certain regional groups like the African group of negotiators to, to make a strong case that POAs need to be treated with special consideration in the transition from CDM to the new Article 6 form mechanism. And so it will be crucial to address, address these concerns um, to, to facilitate an effective continuation of these programs, uh, as I mentioned on the last slide, where significant investments and time efforts have already been invested. Um, but what is required for this to happen is that both public and private sector must work hand in hand to facilitate a smooth transition. I think we don't have time to go into that. That's probably for another day what is required um, to do that. But certainly, we need a national institution. And, and uh, I will say that two weeks ago, the supervisory body for the 6-4 mechanism has made available that process. And the, all the templates and so on are scheduled to be finalized at the end of next week. So I think we are just ahead of a crucial phase now for this transition of POAs and, of course, also the single projects to the new mechanism. So that's also why this webinar here is very timely. Um, we do need strong interaction between governments and the private sector, though, in terms of access to finance and also project implementation. There is a lack of capacity, um, and, and that needs to be a focus of capacity building in the Article 6 context as well. Because, as we know, the Article 6 rulebook was only completed at the Glasgow COP and at the end of 2021. So what we see in our collaboration with many countries is that most of them are in the middle of establishing these participation requirements that are necessary to move forward. Next slide. Yeah, so this is now moving to the final stage of the presentation. There's now two or three slides on concrete recommendations. Um, now, as a synthesis of the empirical analysis, but also the stakeholder consultations that we conducted as part of the research. So we can summarize that there is a very strong support for the POA concept. However, there are also significant adjustments needed to um, align the CDM experience with the new CDM Article 6 principles. So that means on one hand, of course, let's say upgrading to the new quality standards defined in Article 6.4, which represent a significant um, increase in ambition when it comes to baselines and methodologies, for instance. But I think even within the 
uh, experience that we have, we could see clearly that there are some question marks around how we can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of not only registering a POA and including CPAs, but also then really getting to issuance. And this will, of course, be an entirely different discussion in a, in a more attractive carbon market and higher carbon price environment, at least that we hope for. Um, so there's various recommendations. Um, we think we need to recognize more strongly the achievements of POAs. This is now in terms of project numbers or program numbers, but also the conceptual elements. Um, we need to support capacity building and pay special attention to the POAs and capacity building for host countries, but also other actors. We do have some limitations for the successful uptake of POAs that need to be addressed. Uh, we do need to also expand uh, you know, the temporal scope and reduce bureaucracy. And of the norm, because of the normative considerations that we have described earlier, we need to review the needs of LDCs and SIDs and microscale activities. Next slide. Um, I'll do this in one more, more minute and then I will hand back to you, Sandra. So clear recommendations for reform options under Article 6. So improve the efficiency of the POA concept as we know it, recognize first if it, if its achievements, but then continue to evolve it and improve it. Um, so I think this will be an ongoing process where we need to look into the regulatory provisions, but also need to look into how we can harness new, new potentials from the progress made, for instance, in digital MRV. And then, of course, also we need to recognize, as we saw clearly in the, fig in the figures, that only some technologies were supported and we need to look into how we can expand the POA or concept also to other sectors like nature-based solutions and how to attract project finance. Last slide, please. So to wrap up um, and, and maybe um, end on the ongoing interest in POAs in the transition from the CDM to the Article 64 mechanism, and of course, also the voluntary standards, as we said. So this gives you some numbers, what we saw under these temporary measures that are essentially freezing the CDM as of January 2021, um, where Basically, we have these temporary measures that prevent actual issuance of CRs, but still allow for further, you know, administrative processing of, of both registration and issuance and crediting re period renewal requests. So you see the numbers here. I, I will not read them out, but what we can take away is that there is an ongoing level of activity and interest in working with the CDM ahead of the full operationalization of the 6-4 mechanism. So this clearly shows there is interest in the market. Um, and we should really pay attention specifically to the conceptual and, and quantitative elements that we have uh, generated under the POA concept. So very much uh, grateful also for Germany's continuous interest and support in taking this forward. And, and think there's a lot of potential in particular for the LDC sets in Africa, but also on a global level for rapid upscaling once these POAs have been transitioned and can fully include new activities very quickly. Thank you very much for your interest. Now back to you, Sandra. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. This was uh, very insightful. Um, just to say if uh, there are any questions on the presentation, we invite you to uh, put the questions uh, into the uh, Q&A function, and I think uh, Stefan might be able to uh, address them um, while uh, the next session is ongoing, uh, in case you would like to um, yeah, have, a, have a comment or make a contribution verbally. Uh, let's um, uh, we are hoping to find some time towards the end of the session. Um, so with that, um, let us now move to the second part uh, of this webinar, uh, which is the uh, panel discussion. Uh, very happy to uh, that we are joined today by um, yeah, fantastic uh, panel with quite uh, deep expertise uh, on both POA implementation as well as the regulatory side uh, from uh, POA host countries, as well as um, uh, private sector project developers um, and um, from the UNFCCC Secretariat uh, and the World Bank. And I'll uh, uh, introduce the speakers uh, one by one. Um, 
as we uh, go through the discussion. Um, and uh, first, actually, I would like to um, invite Mr. Gajanana Hedge from the UNFCCC uh, Secretariat. And uh, Gash is um, uh, extremely well placed to talk about this topic because he is um, both supporting the CDM Executive Board as well as the Article 64 uh, supervisory body. Um, and um, well, we needed to shift the agenda uh, slightly uh, because uh, Gash also needs to attend an Article 64 supervisory body meeting uh, at the hour. So we are particularly uh, grateful. <laughs> Uh, to have him uh, with us. Um, so I'll uh, kick us off and um, maybe Paris, you can stop sharing the presentation now so that we can uh, see each other. And um, I'll kick us off with uh, the first question uh, to Gash. Uh, thank you for joining. And um, well, Gash, after uh, perhaps this a uh, fervent endorsement that we heard uh, from the research on uh, POAs. I think the first question to you is actually, um, is the Article 6.4 uh, supervisory body at this moment uh, dealing uh, with uh, programmatic approaches of the POA concept? And if so, uh, in which context? Thank you, Sandra, and uh, thanks for uh, mm -hmm. the opportunity to join you. and. Uh, Thanks also for the excellent uh, study and uh, very useful findings. Uh, in terms of uh, Article 6.4, indeed, uh, as was already mentioned, it is included in the RMPs and um, in uh, several places directly and indirectly, the POA approach uh, has support within Article 6. Um, there is it is directly mentioned, but also through uh, specific mention of uh, least developed countries and uh, small businesses, uh, that I, there is some level of prioritization within the rules. Uh, so which will obviously bring the POIs uh, into consideration. And also as was mentioned, many of the transitioning projects uh, would also fall in the cat category of uh, POIs. So from that perspective, also some of the early methodologies which will transition will also probably support the POA work. So there is considerable elements there to support the POAs within the Article 6.4. This year uh, or at this moment, the body is more um, working on the higher level principles, how to operationalize the paragraph 33 of the RMP on increasing ambition and uh, different approaches for um, baselines under para 36 and the additionality and uh, all those, uh, the principal level issues. Um, however, we expect that early next year, many much of the work would focus more on uh, specific methodologies and uh, the approaches uh, for POAs. And uh, we expect some of the early methodologies would facilitate the POAs. Thanks, Gash, for that uh, very clear response. Uh, a follow-up question to you. Um, so as we learn from, from uh, Stefan's presentation, is um, that the, the POA uh, concept is kind of a mixed success. Right. So on the one hand, it was hailed as a, a great innovation. On the other hand, if you look at the issuance, uh, it wasn't so great. So the question to you, whether the secretariat also has looked into um, the success factors or um, uh, bottlenecks in, in the uptake of POAs. Um, and then perhaps I can uh, just follow up directly with uh, also a third question to you. Um, so if you have identified certain bottlenecks, uh, do you also see the potential for addressing some of them? For instance, do you see that like the way the POA cycle works um, and is conceptualized, whether there are any um, ways of uh, improving that? Thanks for uh, the great question. Uh, 
Indeed, many of the elements, uh, Stefan covered it very well, the, the advantages uh, that POI has brought and the regional distribution aspects. I want to add a couple of more elements to it. Uh, seeing from the regulatory side, I had the opportunity to get involved with uh, from day one on the POA related rules and uh, other issues. There was this concept of bundling as was already mentioned from day one uh, under the CDM under small scale. There were methodologies which could have supported uh, energy efficiency activities at household level like efficient lighting or cook stoves, but they did not happen for a long time under CDM. As we all know, although the bundling rules itself was amended several times, it really didn't happen, take off. And one key change that POA bought, brought was this ability to add activities over a long period of time. That was a very significant change. And then it took almost two years to develop the rules. And it, there was a lot of hesitation within the CDM regulatory bodies to, to make these big level changes. It was thought as a very risky affair at that time. But uh, the, yeah, the first factor was then that although it took some time, the rules were very clear. And then there was some level of experimentation and some level of risk taking, which started with this, uh, this option of allowing activities to join over a period of time. But also over time, there was further innovation and further risk taking. For example, the, the, there was this ability of DOEs to add CPAs, which was something new at, the, at, the, at that time. Later on, even CMAs could add <laughs> activities into a POAs, which was, which was some sort of lot of flexibility uh, handed down to other actors within the uh, system. So which, which allowed this um, uh, to, to make some of the changes, but equally uh, at the same time, there were several methodologies were also sort of streamlined to go together with uh, the POAs. There were, Earlier, many of the methodologies were included under Appendix P of um, modalities, which were very simple, but very difficult to apply as well. But later on, when those were amended, there were some very useful default factors added. For example, the, the 3.5 hours for the usage of light bulbs, which uh, made uh, development of POAS in that sector um, easier than before, which uh, earlier methodologies require direct measurement. Similar in other areas, a lot of flexibility and uh, options for, for the project developers. Uh, and also equally the, the interrelationship between POA and CPA was left to market to, to identify and come up with best options. The regulators didn't play a big role in the commercial aspects there. So we can therefore see many entities, both government and non-government entities becoming POA, the POA developers or CMAs. And then underneath many CPAs who are more expert, whose expertise is implementation, they could uh, come up. And also the rules allowed multiple technologies, the multiple countries to be included and, uh, and also clear rules on sampling and surveys because that was very critical to achieve um, the, the, the required simplicity and uh, clarity of rules. And then a clear guidelines through sampling standard was uh, developed. Agree the, the the amount of issuance or the level of efficiency is not as good as it could have been uh, if it was a little earlier because of the prices. Uh, but certainly, the as Stefan mentioned, the, by the time POAS matured, the prices had already dropped. But the overall concept, uh, the POA has uh, perfected uh, the ability to take uh, devices, um, efficient devices and useful equipment to the household level in a very quick and very efficient way that that has worked very well. So there are multiple factors like this and uh, which which allowed uh, POS to flourish. Yeah. Thank you, Gash, uh, for all these uh, insights and um, very glad that you're continuing to 
uh, accompany this process. Um, so I think um, for uh, the, the future development of the concept, um, that's, the, that's great. And um, we might uh, continue thinking together. Um, so I think from uh, the UNFCCC Secretariat, uh, we would now move to um, the host country perspective. Um, and let me make a quick uh, check with um, uh, our next speaker, Takalani. Takalani, can you uh, hear me and can we hear you? Either you're muted or we cannot hear you, I'm afraid. No. Okay. Well, um, that's unfortunate. Uh, we might uh, try a little bit uh, later again. But let me, in this case, uh, directly go to our next speaker and uh, invite uh, Asmao Jibril uh, to the panel. Hi, Asmao. Good to see you. Hi, Sandra. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being with us. So um, Asmao um, uh, used to be the chief scientific officer at the Department of uh, Climate Change of uh, Nigeria's uh, Federal Ministry of Environment, which also uh, serves as the uh, DNA um, for the CDM of Nigeria. Um, and if I'm well informed, recently moved to the newly formed um, uh, National Council of Climate Change uh, of Nigeria, uh, where she is, um, uh, which is responsible for, for uh, Nigeria's Article 6 uh, strategy inter alia. Um, and Asma also is a member of the CDM Executive Board. So um, with all these, uh, this uh, knowledge in your, um, that, that you combine Asma, I think, uh, first of all, I'd just like to ask, um, now after listening to the presentation, listening to um, maybe some uh, bottlenecks that the secret or also successes that the sec secretariat identified and Dash identified, uh, what has been your experience or what has been uh, Nigeria's uh, experience uh, with the POA concept? Okay, Sandra, thank you. And um, Stefan, your presentation was excellent. I think I was one of the um, participants from the interviews you did and uh, you've, you've captured everything well. So our experience in Nigeria, well, like you all know, um, Africa did not really benefit from the CDM, but uh, even at that, Nigeria, uh, which is from the Western part of Africa, has uh, tried to have some few uh, CDM projects registered. We have 11 CDM projects registered and nine POAs. So um, I think uh, in our region, the Western Africa, we're like one of the highest with the uh, CDM and POAs registered. So um, we've also had many proposals. We've seen many project participants. Some come with the uh, proposals and then probably uh, after getting the information, maybe due to cost or so, I don't know, some of them never return, but uh, some will actually, some actually collected letters of uh, approvals, but then uh, we never know what happened <laughs> along the way, they never got registered and all of that. But all in all, we have nine POAs and um, 11 CDM projects at the moment. So um, uh, it's a bit of experience, but I think the last registered project was in 2014, 16, sorry, or 17, between 2016 and 2018, I think. So uh, that was when we last saw a project registered in Nigeria. But um, I think I'm not sure if we have any that uh, have been uh registered uh, under the temporary measures waiting for because i know we've given out like three letters of approval uh, uh around that time around the end of 2020 and uh, i think in 2021 as well 
thanks, uh, Asmao. So um, perhaps let me follow up on that um, uh, pipeline of POAs uh, that you mentioned. Um, so one question would be, um, what kind of challenges uh, did you see? I think you already mentioned that um, as the government, you didn't always know what was happening after uh, the first uh, letter of approval has been issued. Uh, but were there any other things that you uh, noticed uh, and how it might be overcome? Um, uh, as well as um, now that uh, we are talking about the transition uh, from the CDM to Article 6, do you expect that um, the Nigerian POA pipeline um, would request uh, this transition? And um, or is that still a bit unclear at this moment? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Sandra, like I said, the one of the challenges is that after we issue the letters of approval, the project participants never come back. And because, uh, of course, during the CDM era, we didn't have any obligations, so we didn't really follow up whether they got registered or not, or what happened along the way. But, of course, with the Article 6, we will have to start doing that following up and see what happens at the end of the day so that was a challenge uh only we there was once when we had a, a report from one of the communities where a cdm project was uh um the where a cdm project was taking place and then the community complained to the ministry saying that it was it wasn't doing well it wasn't uh, working the way it was supposed to. So that was just one of the projects that we um, went back to to see what was happening. So that was uh, one exception and one example of what the only one we ever um, uh, went back to. So that is a challenge. And then um, I know that uh, people or uh, project. Uh, projects, uh, many projects would want to uh, engage in the CDM or the POEs, but uh, I know there's a lot of, um, uh, there's lack of awareness. People don't know about this, uh, uh, the, the CDM and the POEs. So that is also a challenge for us in Nigeria uh, because uh, I, maybe with the uh, population in Nigeria, it is hard to really reach uh, every corner and uh, each and every person to uh, raise this awareness. But um, we're going to try in this uh, with the Paris Agreement and all of that. We are doing some um, uh, awareness raising and all of that. So um, there's also a weak public-private partnership, the PPP. Also, I think if it was if we had a stronger connection with the, the public and private sector, then um, these things would uh, be easier for project participants to understand and to even know about uh, this uh, 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 this um, programs and all of that. So, um, so with the transition, I think um, it will it will raise uh, the project participants uh, hope i i can we can generally say that the poa was a success uh, because um, there were very few were registered maybe just a few hundreds were registered but then um, it was a success it's uh, easier than the single cdm projects so i think uh, by transitioning these projects uh, to, to 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 the article 6 I think um, it, it will raise hope, it will, people will, will have more faith in uh, registering their projects. And um, uh, that's it. <laughs> Excellent, uh, thank you so much. And of course, it's a very uh, exciting year for POAs and CDM transition, right? Uh, as uh, um, we will, probably know by the end of the year which ones of them uh, the POA uh, developers are requesting to, to transition. Yeah. Um, thank you, Asma.
So I'm not getting signs, unfortunately, that uh, Takalani can um, yet uh, hear us or uh, speak. Um, so Takalani, uh, the moment uh, you are able to connect, please. Uh, oh, okay, hold on. Is this working? No. <laughs> I can hear you, but I'm not sure if the other participants can hear you. Maybe um, can somebody? No, I see Ursula shaking her head. Uh, mm, hold on. No, sorry, sorry, Takalani. I think we need to continue with our uh, technological innovations <laughs> and try somehow differently. Okay, but uh, I'll take. Yes. Yes. Okay. We'll try to figure this out in the background, and uh, I think we'll uh, just move to the next panelist for now. Thank you for calling in. So, yeah, we need to um, uh, figure that out still with uh, Takalani. Uh, so, um, in this case, uh, let us uh, now change then to uh, private sector um, perspectives. And I'm very happy now to invite um, Ms. Ursula Flausmann Kraus from uh, CLIP. So, so Ursula is, um, uh, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah, now it's, uh, now it's better again. Uh, so Ursula is a carbon procurement manager at uh, Click, and as you probably all know, Click has been uh, very active already in part in piloting Article Six uh, transactions. So um, very curious to hear from uh, Ursula. Um, so in the portfolio of uh, Click, um, what do you actually see? Um, is the potential for POA type of activities of uh, small, micro, or even uh, pico technologies? Over to you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra, for the yeah, kind of introduction, and for the question. Yeah, I'm bringing here indeed um, a slightly different perspective from the Click Foundation's experience with programs under Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. And perhaps just a, a word on, on background to, to start. So the Click Foundation is the carbon offset grouping of the Swiss transport fuel importers, and it fulfills a CO2 compensation obligation of those importers under the Swiss CO2 Act by procuring internationally transferred mitigation outcomes ITMOs in countries that sign a bilateral cooperation agreement with Switzerland. And uh, to this end, we develop greenhouse gas mitigation programs uh, set under 6.2, not 6.4 PA. And these programs, they need to be ambitious and they need to really go beyond what countries are anyway pledging under their un unconditional NDC targets. And they also need to comply with the national frameworks of yeah, both the host country, but also the buyer country in this case, obviously Switzerland. And yeah, to, to come actually back to your original question. So what is the role in, of those um, small micro scale technologies in, in our portfolio is um, as a compliance buyer for Switzerland, we follow the regulation under the Swiss Article 6 framework. And that actually allows for both projects and programs. Some sectors are excluded. For example, we cannot do any forestry or other biological things. So we have a really strong focus on energy, energy efficiency, transport or activities of that type. And actually with a few exceptions, all our activities are programmatic. And that is on the one hand also because we use many of those smaller size, smaller unit size technologies or household based, for instance, cook stoves or farm level biogas, biodigesters, e-mobility or solar PV. And we actually also are looking for those programs that can really grow quickly and ramp up over time 
Um, yeah, as, as uh, Stefan has indicated in his presentation, this is really also the, the goal. And some of them might actually be able to cover an entire subsector potentially. Yeah. We, of course, also do acknowledge the, the benefits that come for the, the host countries, low middle income countries, and uh, maybe low income populations. So, this is also very much, I think, aligning with the findings of the report. That is, um, of course, also a good thing, those um, social environmental co-benefits. Perhaps as a, as a caveat, there's, and for us, for, in terms of process, there's no real time or cost saving because the process is the same for all the activities. So the activity description, we call it the MAT, um, gets developed and there's validation or authorization by both the host country and by Switzerland and periodic verification so that is, there's no fast track or simplified process, if you, if you like. Thanks, Ola. And I find this uh, a very strong message that uh, actually you're um, you're basically only looking at uh, programmatic approaches or at um, at uh, some something that can be ramped up, uh, as you say. Um, and uh, what is curious, of course, is that you're. Um, now under Article 6.2 rules, right? So where you have some freedom also in um, um, defining the crediting approaches. Uh, so my question would also be, um, how are you exactly uh, implementing programmatic approaches under 6.2? And are you uh, completely following uh, the CDM processes, CDM POAs? Do you see any challenges with that? Or are you uh seeing that maybe some tweaks here or there uh, are helping you yeah that's a good point so um the process as said is um actually the same for both standalone projects of which we have very few and in the pipeline not really um under active development and programmatic approaches which is really the vast majority and yeah, the other the process is the same so usually the the mat this is our name for the activity design document gets written with an estimated yeah number of units or also um, estimate emission reduction volume and um those then can be included based on clearly defined um inclusion criteria the onboarding of those units is then rather simple with a letter or contract, not necessarily an additional mat. And um, it is possible though, to use an existing PUA and add a new CPA as an ITMO program, as long as the PUA fulfills the criteria of both the host country and the Swiss um, Article 6 framework. The criteria, for instance, for quality or for ambition and some, this also where then sometimes the challenge actually lies. So maybe the program owners might not be able to comply with those um, criteria. So if, if you, I mean, Stefan has presented a, quite a large number of, of POAs where in the cookstoves um, segment and there they would need to be really the high tier stoves, et cetera. So it might not actually be so easy to, to then add um, an ITMO program that fulfills the criteria so, so easily to an existing um, PA. But it's in principle possible. And yeah, perhaps we have to, to find those um, examples that surely will be out there. It's also possible to design a program as a PA in the first place. And it has also happened actually in the case of our first authorized program, the Bangkok EBUS program. It actually is a PA, actually it's two PAs because this is a requirement from the Thai framework. So the, um, the program has to be also registered under um, the TIVR, which is the Thailand Voluntary Emission Reduction Program as a PUA. And here the PUAs have size restrictions, for example, 60,000 tons a year for the PUA or 20,000 for the CPA. That is actually quite effective um, measure to address um, overselling risk and, and manage that risk. And it's not a Swiss, Swiss requirement. So we have different requirements from both the host country and Switzerland. And if in, in our case, it is only one mat, but it's yeah, yet nevertheless, um, the different bus lines are organized in, in different PAs. But and this is perhaps also where a potential challenge can lie because you add complexity if you follow both processes, if, if you like. So um, if you yeah, add um, players, if you add, um, 
um, rules, then you add complexity and potentially also um, yeah, cost and, and time. In this case, it works very smoothly, but as a general rule, I think, or as a general experience or, or lesson, I think from our experience, it's probably, it's probably good to try to limit complexity. And this is perhaps also, as you, as you already mentioned, challenges. We, we, do, we do have some multi-technology programs where it really makes sense, where it's like inherently logical for the success of the program. So let's say energy efficiency in the SME sector, you, you will add a few different technologies or adding biogas and cooking, for instance, that, that just makes sense. But having, yeah, just otherwise uh, linking different technologies is, is, um, can be a challenge and adds complexity, makes it, makes it too complex. And therefore we, we don't really have that. Also multi-country POAs, as was mentioned before, it's a really a great opportunity for some groups of countries, for, for especially SIDS that are just not um, very big on their own. In our case so far, it doesn't work because the Switzerland has signed these agreements with 11 countries and they are more like less scattered around the world. So, and, and uh, of course, to transfer the emission reductions, you need to perform the corresponding adjustments. So it's, it's important that it can be clearly assigned to a country. So, so far, perhaps this isn't, this wasn't really um, a model that uh, that worked for us. Um, so I think, yeah, generally take home messages, yeah, perhaps also for the future to try to, to keep it simple and uh, not make it too complex. Um, another aspect I think that was also really highlighted in the report is the, the capacities both in the public and the private sector that are really, really key. And we also experienced that because Article 62 actually requires even more active host countries than perhaps let's say in, in Kyoto times. So that means um, it's really critical that um, they do have the capacities also in the private sector, but especially also in the public to, to actually get engaged much more frequently. And then perhaps uh, last point is, is guidance, I think was also touched upon on the, on the topic of, of frameworks. So national frameworks are really important. They give that guidance, they give that um, yeah, confidence to countries, what type of activities they want to engage. And then, yeah, it's, it's really good news that so many countries are working on them. And yeah, we think they're really, they're really crucial. Perhaps I'll leave it to that. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, uh, well, I, I learned uh, so much. And I think for me, what is uh, uh, really also an interesting message is that you talked about a cap now on POAs under Article 6, right? That, uh, I mean, normally we are always thinking about how can this POA grow more? But mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you have to, at the end of the day, uh, or think about authorizing uh, mitigation outcomes, then you might, want to stop somewhere at least. For exactly. The for the host country's perspective, it makes actually a lot of sense. Yeah, interesting. Thank you so much. I think the good news is that um, uh, I've seen Takalani now join uh, again, um, and probably with the uh, ability to unmute. Takalani, can you try again? Hi, good afternoon, Sandra and colleagues. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> wow, at last day, technology can be challenging at times. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm not so sure. Are you ready for me or? Yes, I'm ready for you. So okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sandra. Thanks, colleagues, uh, for meeting again, though it's virtually. Um, uh, I've been given a task. Takalani. Uh -huh. Yes. We if you're ready for us, we're completely ready for you, but let me uh, briefly also introduce you. <laughs> okay, thank you, please do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for joining. So um, uh, Takalani Rambau, who's uh, working in the uh, Department of Mineral Resources and uh, Energy uh, of uh, South Africa, and uh, hence also uh, in charge of uh, the um, South Africa's uh, uh, DNA uh, under the CDM. And Takalani, I think uh, South Africa has also a very rich um, pipeline of um, POAs, uh, actually. Uh, so uh, to you also the question, um, first of all, what has been uh, your own experience or South Africa's experience uh, with POA? And over to you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And uh, good afternoon once again, colleagues. 
Um, I think it's a great pleasure to be part of this initiative. Um, thank you so much, uh, Thomas, uh, for inviting us to be part of this, uh, Sandra and, 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 and the team. Um, so yes, indeed, South Africa, it's, um, it's one of the signatories uh, under the UNFCCC. So as indicated, my name is Takaran Rambao. I'm from the uh, government of the Republic of South Africa. We are responsible or we have been given the duties to discharge um, the dis uh, responsibility under the DNA, uh, which is the Designated National Authority for CDM. Over and above that, um, we also have got the responsibility to administer the South African carbon offset program uh, in support of, of the carbon tax, which was implemented in, in 2019. Um, I'll also touch to that, the impact of, of, of the carbon offset uh, uh, program that we have, what it has done uh, to the CDM and POA at large. Um, so indeed, I think uh, I would uh, also echo what the other colleagues have said uh, with the fact that uh, Africa, I think as a whole, uh, did not necessarily benefit much or did not reach uh, what we had anticipated in terms of, uh, of the benefits under the CDM. And I think uh, colleagues have already said a lot. Uh, we've got uh, Kajana and who has also spoken to the challenges that we've experienced. Uh, Stefan has also spoken to some of the challenges. The colleague from uh, Nigeria has also spoken to some of the challenges, which is mainly around the, the bureaucracy that uh, CDM was coming up with. Uh, also around the issues of methodologies. Uh, most of the methodologies were not necessarily fit for purpose in terms of uh, our situation, for example, in South Africa, most of our projects, they are at a very, very uh, uh, small scale, or they are sort of like sub projects, um, which created a lot of challenges and it made most of the, pro uh, of the projects or initiatives not to be uh, uh, cost effective in terms of implementation or to be viable for implementation. So when uh, POAs were then introduced, we started to see a, a shift. Um, we started to see a shift, for example, under the, the, the conventional CDM, uh, our contribution was around uh, 2%, um, I mean, uh, which was very low uh, for Africa. And then once uh, the introduction of, of POAs, which was addressing most of the challenges that we were having, uh, with methodologies, the bureaucracy, and 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 um, which I think colleagues have already said, we we started seeing a different turn, wherein, uh, for example, South Africa became one of the first movers, having registered uh, a, a POA, the Kuyasa Low Cost um, uh, Housing Energy Project, which was one of those first one that were registered, <laughs> and I've seen uh, Sandra you you call this one a, a de facto program of activities, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, we have seen that uh, happening. Uh, for example, in South Africa, we have got a pipeline of not less than 50 uh, projects uh, in terms of POAs. Um, so that on its own, um, from the total pipeline that uh, Stefan has indicated, which is around just below 400, that shows that indeed uh, there was a shift from what it was happening under the conventional CDM to now implementation of, uh, of the POAs. Um, and I'll, I'll try to talk to some of those advantages that at least has made this to, 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 to be a success. I think, uh, some of the challenges that maybe we have been experiencing under the, the standalone or conventional CDM was that you need to know all your activities or you need to have identified all your activities from the beginning, which uh, under the POA, that was not the case. You can then be able to uh, register your POA with at least one or two CPAs, which was good. And at a later stage, you can then add your, your CPAs, which was making life very easy and also cost effective uh, because uh, the, the, I think we all know that the registration cost for, 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 for CDM has always been a, a challenge. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons. 
and then um, it, it has also assisted in uh, increasing the satiety. Um, so there was a lot of uncertainty with uh, a CDM projects uh, because uh, they would go for seven years. Yes, they would have a, a possibility for renewal, but you never know what will happen after seven years. So that also creates some, some risks when you maybe go to the bank to apply for funding uh, for you to be able to implement this. So uh, having POAs that could allow you to go for over 20 years, 21. I remember the first one were 21, and then they went later to 28 with your uh, forestry project. So that was honestly um, something that also created a certainty and has increased the, the contribution of, uh, of, of South Africa in, in the carbon market space. Uh, the other issue that uh, for us, we, we foresee uh, POAs having been one of those that have really helped us to achieve our sustainable development goals, um, your job creation, poverty alleviation, um, you know, uh, so on and so forth, health improvement. Uh, for example, your you cook stove, those are the smallest projects, but with those we have seen people getting employed, we have seen uh, those trying to alleviate some of the poverty challenges that we have in the country. We have seen that also trying to improve the health condition because now when you've got uh, that uh, cook stove, it then uh, reduces the emissions that you, you would be uh, burning while you're using your, your normal wood stock. So those are some of the things that uh, perhaps as a country we have seen. Um, I, I just want to try and, and keep it a bit short. So in the pipeline, uh, we have got um, those that uh, POAs that are using even more than one technology, for example, we've got POAs that are wind and solar, for example, uh, in one POA. Um, so um, it, it allows multiple use of technology as opposed to a conventional CDM, uh, for example. We have got, uh, I've already spoken to the cook stove um, uh, uh, projects. Uh, we have got those that are covering the entire renewable energy um, uh, programs. Uh, for example, we have got the, the SARIP in South Africa, which is one of the South African renewable energy program. So we have got those that are wider, uh, even than just wind and solar. We have got those that are talking to water purification, uh, but I must say this was an international one which was covering more than South Africa. We have got those that are talking to your landfill gas uh, extraction. Um, uh, so our, our POA states are, are quite um, adverse in terms of the coverage. So they cover different technologies, if I may put it that way. So the distribution um, of expected CRs from the registered program of activities, we see South Africa as one of those that are at the top of the pipeline with India having more than 15% of the total emissions and uh, followed by Bangladesh with about 10 and then uh, 10, or just over 10% and then South Africa just below 10%. Uh, that on its own, I think it shows that South Africa has, at least on the POA side, tried uh, its best in terms of implementation. Yeah. Um, so Kalani. after that implementation, uh huh. Kalani. sorry, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, don't mean to uh, cut you short, and okay. uh, this is this is uh, extremely interesting. I'm also thinking that should we um, ever write uh, the next POA study, we should invite you also. <laughs> as one of our <laughs> co-authors. Uh, I just have to quickly jump in because um, formally we have uh, 10 uh, more minutes and we have yeah. uh, two more yeah. speakers and we also have to do the closing. Yeah, let me just touch on the last points that you you had also requested that I, 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 I speak to. Good. So th the last two points, I think it was um, the potential of POEs under Article 6. Uh, I think for me, um, I would like to, to, to echo what Stefan has said, um, that the POAs would really upscale climate mitigation if we are to include uh, POAs under Article 6. Uh, for me, I think they can make a, a huge contribution um, in that aspect. Um, POAs, we foresee them supporting our policy initiatives 
uh, that we have. We have got energy efficiency standard, uh, POAs are supporting that. Uh, I've spoken to the issues of reducing the risk. Um, we foresee POAs also uh, assisting South Africa in achieving its NDC. So for us, um, I think POAs, it would be great if they can be, uh, they can see the light at the end of the day under Article 6, specifically 6.4. Um, let me leave it at, at that on, on the Article 6. Now in terms of the, the challenges, there is a lot of challenges. I think I've already conveyed one in our meeting, Sandra, when we were meeting um, uh, in Bonn. Um, the, one of the challenges of the POAs is that all countries that you need to include, they need to be known at the beginning. We need to find a way wherein even if uh, you can still be able to even add other countries as opposed to only adding the CPAs. Uh, and I, I know I'm speaking this uh, having a risk of, you know, affecting additionality concept and, 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 but I think it's something that we should be open minded and see if it's something that we, we can be able to do. Um, there, there's been challenges that we have experienced with the POA administration, where at some point, um, you find that there's lack of guidance in terms of the role of the program coordinator, um, the financial and legal um, uh, status of that organization in terms of how it should be run. We have seen some of the um, CME disappearing at some point, and you find that some of the uh, POAs are not able to continue. So those are some of the things that perhaps maybe would need to, uh, to be addressed. Uh, the issue of lack of data, um, which is just a general challenge uh, under, under CDM, which I think under Article 6.4, we should be able to try and find ways of addressing that. And I know the CDM executive board has done a lot in terms of streamlining the methodologies in addressing some of this, but I think there's still room for more and also trying to address the bureaucracy that we had under CDM. Uh, I think under 6.4, we should be able to improve that. Let me leave it at that for now. Um, if there's any question, maybe you can, you can then convey them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Takadani. That's uh, amazing. And uh, perhaps also to note that we are planning to um, uh, have an article uh, following this uh, webinar, so um, um, which will come out in the carbon mechanisms uh, review at uh, some point. So any additional points that you couldn't share with us today, please be welcome. <laughs> and I think we could uh, then still uh, make good use of it and, and, and uh, recognize all the challenges. Uh, Thanks, Sandra, I'll definitely do. Thank you so much. Um, so as mentioned, I need to um, beg your indulgence for being a bit uh, late now. Uh, formerly, we are supposed to close uh, at uh, 4.30. Um, and uh, if you allow us, maybe we go another uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes. Um, but let me first of all, um, yeah, especially apologize to our uh, last speakers, uh, Diana Guzman and uh, Harry Gade. And um, let me check with both of them if any of you have a, uh, a conflict so that you need to be uh, leaving on the hour. Diana is fine. Harry, how are you doing on time? We cannot hear you. Can you come again? Unfortunately, I think we have another uh, technical issue. Uh, we could hear you earlier, Harry, so I'm not sure what's happening. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. Okay, yeah, I'm fine with the time, thanks. Oh, okay, great. Perfect, so then we will just uh, continue uh, in our normal order. Um, and I'm very happy now to invite uh, uh, Diana Guzman Barasa uh, from uh, Elcott, where Diana recently joined uh, as the Article 6 Global Climate Director. So I guess uh, we need to take turns, Diana, with uh, unmuting. <laughs> Otherwise, there's a bit of an echo. Um, 
Yeah, so let me uh, kick off with the question, basically, um, as, a, as a project developer, including in uh, CDM and Article 6. Um, so what is your experience with, um, with the POA concept uh, in terms of both challenges and lessons learned? Thank you, uh, Sandra, for the invitation and for the introduction. Okay, so in our view, the POAs present a very interesting opportunity moving forward. Because we, we notice like many of the many countries have like um, sister indices, so um, they can have similar challenges. For example, many of the island states in, in the Caribbean all have the same uh, waste management problem. So the same technology can be applied in multiple countries. So having everything in a regional POA, for example, would really facilitate things, although the bilateral agreements of course um, have to be seen uh, on a one on one basis, like uh, spoken with um, with Ursula, but uh, definitely that's something that we would like to push forward in Article 6.4. And actually, we are um, very uh, motivated to be part of all of this transition. We're actually like now um, offering the service of, of consulting uh, for the project developers to transition into Article 6.4. But one of the challenges is, is um, of course, uh, that uh, well, everything is not very clear yet in Article 6.4 and like the government representatives themselves still don't have a clear way forward. So DMAs are, uh, some of the countries don't even have appointed one or some just, you know, are not responsive because the, the, the road forward is not clear. So that may present a challenging uh, moving forward forward with 6.4, definitely. And um, well, another challenge is uh, that unfortunately, although there are similar cha challenges, also there is a lot of uh, variability so it's sometimes difficult to have like one solution fits all, although, you know, it is a yeah, similar problem with a similar technologies can be applied. But then as uh, some of the other panelists pointed out, then, you know, the sizes are different. The, the times moving forward in, in, the, in different countries are also differ. And that's why sometimes there is a lag. So as, as uh, we mentioned um, on some of the earlier participations, like there are many uh, POAs uh, registered, but not many of them issued with issue like credits and this is what happens. So the, in, in, in uncle's experience that uh, uh, some things get, um, uh, the way they experience a lot of challenges in, 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 in the way um, in the way forward that are not necessarily foreseen. And uh, well, sometimes there is the layouts and, and people get very ambitious trying to cover um, many things in the board because it's okay, no, let, let's uh, take advantage and we're going through this process and we're using the same methodology and and let's move forward like this. So they, they get very, very ambitious. So you see uh, regional POAs with many countries in there, but then actually just like one part is, is, is active. And this is what happens because it, sometimes there is, yeah, similarity, but there also variability and, and especially in the way moving forward. The surveys, for example, are very expensive to carry out. So it's not easy, for example, to go out and you know visit like many households and out in the, out in the field. So that sometimes uh, presents a very big, uh, um, challenge, uh, but what uh, some something that could really help uh, um, things uh, be pushed forward could be having um, more whitelist. So as the countries get prepared to transition into Article Six, uh, maybe six point two or six point four, having whitelist really facilitates uh, from the project developer's point of view. So it is very um, easy for us, for example, to take uh, Ghana's example and see the whitelist. So we will know right away what can work and what does not work. Uh, Ursula with the Click Foundation also has a whitelist that, that they, we know already what what, click, what we can offer. Click. We know already what we can offer um, to the government in Ghana. But this is a very uh, big uh, black box in the rest of the countries for now, right? So they have different levels of advancement. Some of the countries that are involved in the um, data and maths program for GGGI are a little bit more advanced in, in comprehending the opportunity and getting their institutional arrangements. But all of the rest are, are and also, also in the countries that are involved with the with Hari, with the centralized uh, crediting framework, they will also have a, a way to uh, streamline some of the processes that, that can be also useful for Article 6. But for the rest of the countries, we still need to have some patience because moving forward requires more uh, clarity on behalf of the governments. Although we can have clarity with the project proponents, with the project owners, with the technology partners, with the developers and consultants that uh, intervene as ourselves, uh, we still need to go through the bilateral agreements and process with the host country. So that presents a, a big challenge um, moving forward, forward into Article 6. 
And um, lastly, uh, we mentioned earlier about the new technologies. So another challenge that we see in, in incorporating new technologies is that often uh, these uh, very new technologies or, or future technologies are, are not often part of the MDC uh, themselves, and even less part of the conditional MDC. So that's, that's often a, a different team that is preparing the MDC than the team that is preparing the long-term strategy where we usually see these new technologies. So uh, having more communication between these two teams and getting those new technologies since the start in, in the MDC implementation plans and more even better in the condition plans would definitely fast forward and streamline the processes. But for now, there is a little bit of a disconnection. So it is difficult to apply all of these emerging technologies in, in the MDC implementation plans. So these are um, keeping brief because I know we are, have a time constraint, but uh, these are some of our views uh, for now. But we are like moving forward. We in fact um, uh, participate right now with Ursula in two countries with the MAD development for ITMOS, uh, for ITMO purchasing. And we developed this um, process also to offer uh, the consulting services for 6.4, transition from CDM to 6.4. So we are moving forward and we are, are very high in, uh, in spirits um, that it is going to be possible to fast track uh, BOAS and TPAs. So, yeah, with this, I, I conclude uh, and try to keep brief. <laughs> Fantastic. And thank you so much, uh, Diana. But uh, also really uh, fascinating to uh, hear like the struggles on the ground. Uh, so, you, you can really uh, uh, feel part of this uh, as you were explaining. <laughs> Could uh, very much uh, relate to some of the difficulties. Um, so then, uh, indeed, let me uh, turn last but not least to um, uh, Harry Kumagade, uh, who is a, a senior climate change specialist uh, at the World Bank. Uh, thanks for uh, joining, Harry, and being uh, so patient. And um, so I guess, uh, well, the World Bank, on the one hand, uh, uh, is very active uh, as an implementer of uh, POAs or is supporting many uh, POAs purchasing uh, uh, emission reduction credits from uh, from POAs. Um, so you have uh, a lot of uh, on the ground experience through that. But at the same time, I think you're also at the forefront of thinking through uh, some of uh, possible um, uh, reforms of the POA concept or how things might uh, be even more simplified or uh, involve lesser uh, transaction costs. So uh, Diana already mentioned the, the standardized uh, crediting framework, which is a brainchild of the World Bank. Um, uh, so yeah, could you perhaps share with us both your uh, experience with um, implementing POAs at the World Bank, your ideas of um, how POAs uh, could be reformed as well as uh, also what how the World Bank uh, is working with host countries in in this area. So sorry for throwing a <laughs> lot of questions at you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thanks also, first of all, for the invitation. And uh, also, yeah, Stefan, for presenting excellent report, uh, now, uh, which has uh, some uh, good ideas, actually, for us to consider. I mean, um, I mean, you all know that, of course, the bank has been working uh, uh, in this space uh, now for more than two decades and, uh, and led many reform processes during the, of course, the CDM days, especially and the POAs. Um, so at the moment, of course, as, as you rightly mentioned, Sandra, that uh, um, banks work related to, of course, you know, directly you know, on POAs is you know, uh, in the context of the work that we are doing mostly in Africa. To support you know countries with this energy access agenda through a so-called standardized rating framework, uh, of course, the idea behind that is that of course like you know how do we make use of the the potential that uh, the concepts like the POA can offer uh, while introducing uh, some new you know um, ideas or new innovation basically to reduce the transaction costs and then in the pro in the in the way of like you know introducing more accountability to host countries uh, but also of course like you no know, speeding the process of bringing the credits to the market um, and of course obviously you know simplifying the uh, especially the mrv requirements for the project developers um, you know whether the uh, scf kind of framework works for all kind of technologies is that to be seen uh, but of course at least you know the the initial idea was to see 
uh, where you know, some of the innovations that the CDM brought uh, in terms of the you know, standardized baselines and, and of course the you know, simplified additionality or the, or the positive lists uh, and, uh, and of course like you know, default factors for you know some monitoring parameters where it is relevant. Um, so how do you actually bring all of these uh, innovations together? then introduce of course a, a framework in which of course the country takes the complete ownership and accountability uh, of course uh, also keeping in mind that now the article 6 especially also requires host countries to play a, and a major important role in terms of like you know, how they you know, manage the you know, domestic processes and etc so from that point of view i think the the standard creating framework is expecting to provide a lot of insights to us like you know, how uh, easy or how challenging it is actually even you know, no simplified you know, process like SCF could be implemented uh, in, in countries where the you know, capacity is a big issue as you no know, many other speakers mentioned. Um, of course, like you know, building on that one of the thing, two things actually I wanted to highlight things that we want we are focusing mostly is that you no, know, yeah, Stefan also mentioned, of course, like you know, the POS can facilitate uh, uh, multi-technology approaches and then and then of course business model neutral so that you no know, especially the small project developers can be part of the you know this uh, ecosystem and then access the carbon market so that's basically how do we actually help uh, more uh, uh, private sector participation um, in the in the process i mean that's basically one one thing that we are uh, focusing a lot and the second one is of course obviously i think also one of the recommendations i think in the report is also the digitalization of the mrv um, so where of course, like you no, know, the POA has helped us to simplify many of the things in terms of like you know, how the CPS can be included and then what the start date of this, you know, uh, for, for these projects could be, etc. But can we go a little bit further actually in terms of like you no, know, um, can we have an option where um, the credits can be generated from the day you know the systems are, for example, implemented or deployed on ground? Um, and then how do we basically help uh, facilitate real time monitoring of those data um, so so to the centralized to platform or centralized mrv frameworks i think that's where where we are um, very soon actually start starting of course like you now one of the scf is uh, is going on in nine countries but we are now uh, planning to start a, a very big uh, you know, regional energy access program in east and then southern africa uh, where of course like you know it's a five billion bank lending program to increase the energy access in, in these two regions. So where we are trying to see how the regional approaches actually can can help, uh, you know, in the context where can we aggregate these emission reductions for you know, similar type of the projects, where the of course regional actor can play a you know important role in terms of like you know aggregating these things. But as we all know, I mean, it's like, you know, I think one of the challenges that we already, you know, <laughs> missing is that, you no, know, given that, you no, know, now under Article 6, you know, each country has their own NDCs and then their own requirements in terms of, like, you know, how to do the authorization and then how to treat the ownership of these credits. So how do we actually handle such kind of issues um, under the regional approach? Uh, what the pros and cons, like, you know, whether can we simplify such a requirements in a way that, you no. Know, you know, some centralized agency in consultation with the host country DNS can play an increasing role um, so that this transaction cost can be. So we are very excited about that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, work that is likely to start very soon. And then, of course, and integrating the digital MRV into that and then making use of the you know, different open source infrastructure like bank, UNDP and others are developing. So we are bringing basically together the regional actors, and then the digital MRV, and then the multiple sector, sorry, multiple technologies, you know, and, and the different countries uh, to a kind of a you know, regional platform where, of course, we are hoping that you know, we can also bring some kind of innovation to the how the methodologies can be, you know, of course, developed in terms of like, you know, how do we actually you know, quantify these emission reductions? So for a similar type of activities, but spread across in different countries, can we go one step ahead and then see you know, linking these emission reductions to the increase in the electrification rate instead of going into surveys or individual you know, activity level. So we are basically trying to bring many of these uh, aspects into this one while building the capacity of the different actors. 
So I will stop you here. I'm just like you know, happy to uh, on, you know, elaborate a little further, more than and if needed. But I think that's basically what we see. There's a lot of opportunities here, of course, like you no. Know, and then uh, Article Six Point at least provides a little bit of flexibility in terms of you know, how we can handle these things and uh, and then introduce more innovation, um, making use of you know some of the things that we already achieved, but taking one step behind beyond actually, including of course the sectoral approaches that you all know that the bank has been working. I stop here. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you so much, uh, Harry. So that's uh, really interesting to hear already about the new frontiers, also that <laughs> that you are thinking in a, a in a scaled up uh, approach. Um, and again, I would also like to thank you all again uh, much for your uh, indulgence. Um, I see that there's a um, uh, question in the chat uh, for you, Harry. So maybe you can uh, address that. Um, and um, so from my end, I think you can um, hopefully address that uh, directly in, in writing. Uh, so from my end, I just want to uh, thank everybody so much for uh, staying so long with us. I think this has been a lot of uh, food for thought. I found it uh, extremely interesting. Um, and not attempt to uh, summarize anything, uh, but for that, I will <laughs> I will pass the floor actually to Thomas uh, to uh, share with us his final thought and then uh, conclude the meeting. Thank you. So thank you um, all panelists and thank you especially Sandra for this moderation, wonderful, thank you. Uh, what can I say at this final moment, at this uh, lead uh, moment? I think it's for me, for the uh, ministry uh, responsible for carbon markets in Germany, it is clear that we go further this way, we will do our best to discuss this. We have several ministries which could be active. Um, on the uh, car market and especially on the POAs. Uh, so I will bring it as a promise into our internal interministerial coordination. Um, and to make it clear, we have uh, uh, also the traditional environmental ministry uh, in favor for removals. Uh, for certain removals, of course, and uh, the uh, BMZ, our uh, economic uh, cooperation ministry with the uh, development aid. So there are many uh, ministries such as Article 6, even if we are not buying for compliance. Furthermore, we will bring it into the project pipelines of our um, capacity building projects, which we see really running uh, that countries with the NDCs formulating their strategies are keen to know which project types they can undertake, how they will do it. One example we have experienced just ahead of the ESB meeting now in Bonn, that certain countries, even uh, far advanced in the Article 6 preparation, think about uh, positive which are easy to accept for the NDC strategies. I think uh, we are on a good way and we should take up uh, what uh, Sandra said for the next CMR. We should try our magazine uh, to bring a big focus on, on the POAs. And of course, we will try also um, to ask what is the uh, yeah, best way forward for POAs after COP. 28. So uh, this could uh, result, of course, in a new uh, project activities for the promotion of this idea. And we would like really support the SB, the supervisor body, to think about something which allows uh, for the host countries to be flexible to the NDCs and standardization should be done uh, for the methodologies, especially, which we can also use for Article 6. So many things to do, and I'm very uh, grateful to this discussion today because it uh, brings us on the way to, to work further on POAs, etc. And thank you all for joining this afternoon. Thank you, and bye, everyone. Great. Good. Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.